learning algorithms with category theory. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a real uh, honor to be here because I started learning category theory a few months ago. Uh, so I'm sort of nervous uh, giving a talk to the category the theory seminar. And I should say, first off, uh, all of this is completely trivial. And I also don't know category theory. So um, with, with that in mind, uh, please be gentle. Um, this is basically, this story comes as I was trying to learn category theory. I wanted to work out this one example, which is for me a motivating example of of what category theory might be useful for. Uh, I thought it was obviously something that would have been done, you know, 40, 50 years ago. I posted a question on uh, Math Stack Exchange uh, and got no answers and emailed these guys to, to see if they might know the answer. And in the meantime, I think I'd worked it out and it seemed like nobody had ever written it up, so I wrote it up. And that's um, uh, and that, that's, that's, that's basically what I'm going to tell you about today. It's a very, uh, a very uh, basic example of a, uh, a, a natural transformation, actually a dinatural transformation applied to machine learning or really uh, just, just statistics. It's such old machine learning, it's really better called multivariate statistics. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about um, first um, an introduction to basic multivariate statistics. I imagine not everyone here is going to know things like linear regression and, and ridge regression. In fact, hands up who does know those. Actually quite a few, but not everyone. Okay, so, so the very basic introduction to some of these most simple machine learning algorithms that are so simple they were used before the word machine learning was, was used, but that's what they are. Then, apply to these a definition of what it means for a learning algorithm to be invariant. And then, at the end, a conjecture, which I haven't proved, um, which is maybe a bit less trivial. Uh, and, and one possible way that somebody who is interested might go about thinking about proving it, that's not going to be me, because I've, I've got kind of a day job. Uh, but, um, but okay, so this is, this is the outline of the talk. All right, so first, very basic introduction to classical multivariate statistics. Um, the, the, the most basic examples of machine learning algorithms. And something like a deep neural network is your modern machine learning algorithm. This is the shallowest possible neural network because it has one layer, but it is still part of the same class of, of algorithms. Um, okay, so in multivariate statistics, um, you deal with uh, a, a set of observations and you, you want to learn something about them. So each observation, you, you have a number of n observations. Each one of these observations uh, comprises one or more real valued vectors, just a collection of numbers. So you make these observations n times and each time you observe p real numbers, which you put together into a vector, and you might observe another set of q uh, real valued numbers, which you put together into another vector. So you have n observations, and each one of those consists of, of a collection of the same number of vectors, and those vectors have the same dimension, and you want to learn something about these vectors. Um, so uh, here are just some very basic examples of that. So one example would be a density estimation. If you want to learn a probability distribution that these vectors come from. So your, your data is a set of uh, n vectors. We'll index them x, i. Uh, and they live in r to the p. Uh, n p-dimensional vectors. And we assume they're statistically independent. In other words, if you know what uh, the first one is, it has absolutely no bearing on the probability distribution of the second one. And so what we might want to do is learn a probability distribution for the distribution of these vectors i. And the way you might do it is you have a loss function, which is a real number, which depends on the probability distribution p, which is parameterized by a set of more real numbers. Uh, and it depends on the vectors. And you'll optimize over the 
of the parameters of your probability distribution to maximize your, your score, uh, your success function, which is often the, the log likelihood, in other words, the, the log of the probability of these observations, um, which is, of course, the sum of the logs of the probabilities of all of them, because we assume uh, they're independent. So an example of that is if you have a Gaussian distribution, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, the probability distribution goes like this. C is the, the covariance matrix. So, um, yeah. So uh, we, we've got our vectors x, which live in uh, R to the P, and the covariance matrix is the, the variance of the, the first dimension, uh, which, which means the expectation of um, it's squared, etc. variance of the second, mm. and then the covariances of the two of them, of every pair, mm. which is the expectation of all the, all the pairwise products. Right? And, and if you know that matrix, plus the mean, if the mean is non-zero, that completely summarizes the probability distribution of the multivariate Gaussian distribution. And one of the most common things you would do in, when you, in practice you get one of these data sets, if you've got a very large number of dimensions, uh, you will reduce the dimensionality by doing principal component analysis on this matrix C. You'll find its eigenvectors and its eigenvalues. The eigenvectors are called the principal components, and the eigen and if you project x onto these principal components, so if the principal components are v1, v2, up to v um, p, because they have to be the same number of them, then x dot v1 is again a Gaussian distributed. Uh, variable because the sum uh, and, and, and multiples of any Gaussian are also Gaussian uh, and it's statistically independent of x dot v1 so what you've done x dot v2 so what you've done you've taken all your correlated variables and you've linearly transformed them into something that's uncorrelated and the next thing is that you've got them arranged in order so that as you um, as you go down the list the variance of these will get smaller and smaller, but less and less important. So what you've done is you've taken the most important bits of your data, and then you, you've taken successively less important bits of your data, at least ranked by the size of the variance. In other words, the amount of the total uh, length of these vectors that they explain. Okay, so this is a type density estimation, and it's called unsupervised learning in the sense that you've just given this vector, you're not told to predict anything from this vector, x, you're trying to understand the structure of the, the, the vector x uh, by giving it a probability distribution. Uh, that's what, it doesn't always have to be a probability distribution, that's just one way. Okay, the, the next thing we'll talk about, and this is going to be what's the main point, is what you could call supervised learning. Um, supervised learning, you're given two vectors. So you've got um, uh, now a vector uh, xi, and for every one of these, you also have another vector yi, and these are in different dimensional spaces. So, um, for example, here you might uh, observe the genotype of somebody, everything about all their genetic information, there will be thousands of numbers that go into this vector x, and for every one of these people, you've got another lot of vectors such as their height, uh, their, their weight, uh, all, all sorts of uh, phenotypes of this individual, and what you want to do is you want to predict y from x, so you want to learn a rule for predicting how tall somebody is from their genotype, from, the, from their gene expression, or something like that. It could be, it could be anything at all, right? But when you're predicting one thing from another, and um, there are many ways to do this, and linear regression is by far the simplest, and it's the most traditional. It's, it's probably 100 years old by now. 
And the, the key point here is that you're learning a linear map, right? And that's what makes it simple and very tractable, is that you're learning a linear function from x to y. Mm. Nowadays, uh, the algorithms that people use uh, to do face recognition and, and all of that stuff is, is similar, in, except that it's learning nonlinear maps. And we now have some pretty good algorithms for learning nonlinear maps. And when I say all of this is trivial, it's trivial because it's looking at the linear case. If it were possible to answer these sort of questions in the nonlinear cases, that's when this, this would cease to be trivial, I think. Okay, so uh, what we want to do to learn this function f, we're given just one data set. So we're given n of these vectors x and a corresponding n of the vectors y, and we want to learn this linear map f. And the way we do it is we write down a loss function that characterizes how well we've done. It's the error in the prediction. So for every i, we're predicting y from x. So we take f of x uh, and we subtract y from it. Uh, this should have been a norm because this is a vector. So this should have been the, the, the L2 norm uh, squared uh, of, of that vector. And you sum it over all of them. And that gives you the error. And you want to find the f that minimizes this loss function um, L. And that actually is the same as if we had assumed a Gaussian distribution, again, for these, uh, for these vectors uh, y, if we'd assumed a Gaussian distribution for them, minimizing this squared error function would be the same as uh, maximizing the probability of, of seeing y given f. So that, that would be a maximum likelihood estimation of, of f, as it's called. All right, so this is what we want to do. We want to find f for a given uh, set of vectors x and y. We want to find the f that minimizes this loss function, in other words, that, that causes the best fit. Um, so um, it turns out it's, it's analytically tractable. It's not hard at all. So what we'll do is we'll get our data matrix, we'll get our data x, the n vectors that live in a p-dimensional space, and we accumulate them into a matrix, an n by p matrix, and we call it x. And we get the, um, similarly, the, the vectors uh, y, and we accumulate them into a n by q uh, matrix y. So they've got the same number of rows, but different number of columns. And we're going to represent f uh, by a... Um, by a, a matrix multiplication, right? And W here is a, a P by Q matrix, right? So you multiply it into here, and you get an N by Q matrix, which is our estimate of Y. And it's very easy to show that if you want to minimize that loss function, the formula that minimizes it is, is this, right? So you take X transpose times X, uh, and you invert it, and you multiply it by x transpose times y. That's easy uh, to show um, just, by, uh, just by doing the math. And the point is, unfortunately, what I just rubbed out, um, x transpose times x is the covariance matrix of x. So right, the ij element of that is the expectation of x i x j. Uh, modulo dividing by n, which you need to do, and modulo subtracting the mean. But the point is, this is the covariance of x, which is the thing you're trying to predict from, and this is the covariance of x with y. Right? So if you've got a particular column of x that's correlated with a particular column of y, then when you make the covariance matrix of the two, which is x transpose y, uh, which is going to be a p by q matrix, then you'll have a large number corresponding to the column of x that was correlated with a column uh, of y. Right? 
And, and so that's going to, if, if, if this was an identity matrix, that would mean that this is your predictor matrix. The, the column of this that's correlated with the column of that, this column predicts that one, right? So that makes sense. But this term here, this inverse of the covariance matrix, what this means uh, is that if you had this uh, column of x had a large variance, in other words, it was very large numbers that correlated with this, then the weight goes down, right? Because, uh, and that makes sense, because if you double uh, x, right, and you're learning a function to predict y from x, then the function should half, right? It shouldn't double, it should half. And so if you think about the dimensions here, you've got, in the sense of dimensional analysis, you've got the dimensions of y of x and of x to the minus 2. So this has the dimensions of y times x to the minus 1, right? It's y over x, and that's why if you double x, you'll half um, f, which is as it should be. All right, so, so this is the, the optimal solution to the linear regression problem when you want to predict y from x, um, and it's great, but there's a problem which prevents it from being used in practice when the dimensionality of x is large. In other words, when you have a very large number of columns of x, there's a problem. And the, the, the simplest way to see the problem is if p is greater than n, in other words, if you have more columns than rows here, then this matrix is not invertible, right? Because it's a p by p matrix of rank n. It's not invertible, so there is no solution at all. And this situation where p is greater than n is something that actually happens a lot. For example, that case of the genome that I talked about, you've got thousands of genes, and, and you won't have that many observations. You won't have that many people in your study. This is a case where p is greater than n, so there will be no solution uh, to this problem. And, but it's, it's even more bad than that, because even if p is less than n, um, you get an answer, but the answer is useless, in the sense that it's uh, maybe numerically unstable wasn't the right word. The, the point is it will make a prediction, but it, it, it overfits in the sense that the prediction it makes is entirely determined by the particular random factors you happen to have in your, in your training data. And now when you produce a new uh, example to test it on, it's going to get it horribly wrong. And essentially the reason for that is that you've got all of these dimensions of x, all of these principal components. So if, if you think about the, the data you started with x, it's got some, some dimensions of large variance and some dimensions of very small variance. And because it inverts this matrix, it's going to blow up these dimensions of small variance to be extremely important, um, and it's going to weight them very highly, but they might just be measurement noise, right? So unless you have very large numbers of observations, this method is going to give you problems because it's going to overfit the data. It's going to pay lots of attention to the tiny, fine details of your input, uh, at the expense of the large ones, and so it's going to give you bad performance in, in practice. Um, okay, so, but you don't have to give up because there are solutions to this, and the classical uh, solution, again, many decades old, is, is something called regularization or, or ridge regression. And this is, this is only the most simple one. It's not the only one to use. It's still probably one of the best ones to use, but it's certainly not the only one out there. But it's the simplest one. And the, the way it works is, here's the loss function we had before, the error. And we add to it now what, what's called a penalty term, um, which is just the squared norm, the, the Frobenius norm of, of W, right? which is the, the matrix that encodes the linear transformation F. Right? So our loss function now is how bad our prediction is, plus the squared norm of the, of the weights. And the solution to this, again, is analytically tractable. And it has this form. 
so this is the covariance matrix that we started with and we invert it. This is the same as before. The difference is, before we invert this, we add a, a multiple of the identity matrix weighted by lambda, where lambda is this parameter, the size of the weight squared. Um, and this is, this is uh, called ridge regression. That's, I don't know why it's called that. It's just what it's called. Um, and what this does is it makes the fit worse on the training data. So the training examples x and y you started on, it makes the loss function worse because the plain ridge regression, where lambda equals 0, was by definition the optimal solution. So when you set lambda not equal to 0, it makes the solution worse. So why would you do it? The reason you would do it is it makes the generalization better. So now, if you take your data here that you started with x and y, and you add some new um, uh, observations, and now you've learned your function f, you want to see how f does on the new observations, um, the f that has a lambda, a positive lambda, is going to do better than the original f, uh, which had lambda equals zero, on the new observations. It's going to do worse on the observations you trained it on, but it's going to do better on the new observations. And the reason it does that is because of this, uh, this lambda in here. So the point is, what, ridge regre what, what linear regression does is it takes the, the principal components, the eigenvalues of your covariance matrix, and it inversely scales by them. So if you've got a correlation with this, it counts for much more than a correlation with that. But what ridge regression does, because you've added this lambda here, it's like adding a spherical covariance to this. So this one, if it's got a very small uh, variance, when you invert it, you're still going to get um, th this variance plus lambda inverse. So the size of the boost you can get from this is never any more than lambda inverse. So in other words, the dimensions of very low variance aren't going to count as much as they would in the ordinary ridge regression. So this is why when you have high dimensional data sets where you've got lots of these low dimensional small size dimensions, that's why you use this method or something like this. Okay, so um, every statistician or machine learning practitioner intuitively knows the following fact. And, and this is what we're going to try and formalize this intuition, and this is what we use category theory. So, the point is, with linear regression, you can change your measurement units. If your measurement was, uh, you know, you're measuring a height in meters uh, and uh, velocity in, in knots and um, temperature in Fahrenheit, uh, it wouldn't matter um, if you change those all to centigrade uh, you know, light years per, per second and parsecs, right? As you can change the measurement units as much as you like, uh, and it won't make any difference because, uh, uh, because uh, the, the function you learn will just automatically adjust for that change in measurement units. And also, the other thing with linear regression is that the different variables can have different units. So, if you've got one in, in your predictor variable x, if one column is measured in meters and another one's measured in seconds, that doesn't matter. You can mix them together with, with no problem. On the other hand, with ridge regression, you can't do that, right? Because the first thing is, if you think about dimensional analysis, suppose these measurements were all made in meters, um, then lambda better have the dimension of meters squared. Um, and if this were in centimeters, you're going to have to change lambda if you want to get the same answer or, or a comparable answer when you change the units of x. But it gets worse than that. If some of these x's are measured in, in meters, some of the columns, other columns are measured in seconds, then there is no way lambda could have the appropriate units. Yeah? Um, but even before the regularization, we were using a transpose, right? In other words, an inner product which would already have dimension. Right? So implicitly, this isn't invariant to arbitrary linear transforms because we already have the transpose operation. No, because the, the, the transpose is, um, unless I've got it wrong, unless I wrote it down wrong. No, I don't think I did. Transpose is x transpose x. 
right? Okay. So that means we're taking the, the dot product of this column with, with that column. Right. But dot product is not, like vector spaces don't naturally come with dot product, right? So we're already, we're already considering a vector space equipped with that. And so, so we can sort of push the units into, in other words, the I is not really identity, but it's really a rank two zero tensor. Or, or I'm not sure whether it was, no, I'll ask later, yeah. No, 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 this is an important point. So, so okay, at the naive level, right, if this is measured in meters, right. and that's measured in seconds, then their dot product is measured in meters times seconds. Right. Yeah. right? So when you say it's a vector space, it's an n-dimensional vector space, mm -hmm. r to the n. Okay. Right? And the question is, and we'll come to this in a moment, what are the transformations of r to the n you can do that leave your linear regression invariant? And, and this is exactly the sort of thing well, we, we want to ask. So one thing you can certainly do is you can swap the rows around. Right? You can, you can permute the rows. Turns out you can actually do more than that. Um, but but uh, if we'd have done it the other way, x times x transpose, whoops, x times x transpose, then we'd be taking the dot product of this row with another row, and now we really do have a problem of mixing the units. Okay. All right, but this is exactly the sort of question we want to get to, and I think we're about to get to it right, right now. So, so what does it mean to say... What, how are we going to translate that idea into an actual statement, that intuitive idea into a statement? And this is what uses um, category theory. So, so, so here's the idea. We define a category whose morphisms describe the invariances of the algorithms. Right? And we'll get to what that is uh, in a moment. But the point is, if we want the, uh, as we were just talking about, the algorithm to be invariant under permutation of the rows, then the category needs to have morphisms corresponding to all the permutations of the rows. If we want it to be invariant under linear transformations of the columns, it better have those uh, morphisms. Uh, and we're going to define <coughs> two functors from this category um, to the category of sets. One of them, the functor D, describes how the data sets are transformed. So in other words, how X and Y are transformed under these uh, uh, morphisms that we want to, the morphisms that leave their algorithm invariant. Uh, and the other one, P, describes how the functions that have been learned, the functions F, are going to transform as a consequence of these transformations of the data set. And, and, and a learning algorithm, an invariant learning algorithm, will be defined as a natural transformation between these functors. Actually, a dinatural transformation, unless I made a mistake, and it is entirely possible that I have. Um, OK, so, so let's now get into the point. Right? So here's the category we're going to talk about. So we've got, remember, we've got this matrix X. Um, which is the, the, the source, it's what we're predicting from, say the genotype that we're predicting, and, 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 and the matrix Y is what we're predicting to, it would have one column for height, one column for weight, uh, etc. So, the category is going to be um, X cross Y cross I, right? So X describes how we're going to permute the columns of X. Y describes how we're going to permute the columns of Y. And I describes how we're going to permute the, col the rows of both of them. And we're going to permute the rows of both of them together. So for linear regression, X is any linear invertible transformation. And we'll, we'll see why in a moment. I'll, I'll give you the, the proof of why this works in a moment. But for X, we can make any transformation, any linear transformation we like of the, the columns as long as it's invertible. For Y, we can make any um, uh, linear transformation at all, whether or not it's invertible. 
and for i, we can do any permutation of the rows. We can uh, swap row 1 and 2, 1 and 5, whatever, but it, it has to be a permutation. It's going to turn out that actually there is a, a larger set of permutations we can do of i, but let's get to that later. Okay, so that's the category x cross y cross i. Actually, it's... Uh, no, uh, I, won't, I won't say that yet. X cross Y cross I is the category that, that we're dealing with functors uh, from. Okay, so what's the data set functor? So this is, a, let's call it C, is this, is this category. And we've got a functor C, uh, C D, which maps C uh, to sets. Um, okay, so the, uh, the categories, the objects of the categories, because they're finite dimensional vector space, uh, spaces, they're, they're just uh, determined by two numbers, the dimensionality. Uh, X determined by object of X, uh, we'll call it P, and Y we'll call it Q. And um, the, uh, the objects of the invertible permutations, right? Remember, this was um, invertible uh, permutations of finite sets. The objects there will again be the a number, the cardinality of that set, which we'll call n, right? So the point is the objects that it sends this to are pairs of data matrices. So you've got one n by p matrix and one n by q matrix. Um, what about the, uh, the morphisms? So yeah. Pairs or one or the other? I meant pairs. Did I use the wrong symbol? Yeah. You have a product pair. You're right. Okay. I meant, uh, this should be direct sum, I think. Direct sum of two? Well, yeah. Yeah. Pro yeah, yeah. yeah. Sets. Product of sets. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That was a mistake. And I spent so long looking up what the code was for that symbol. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so now, what about the morphisms? So the morphisms of X are any invertible um, uh, any invertible linear transformation are the morphisms of X, and, it's, uh, and, and we get a pair of these matrices, and it's going to act just by matrix multiplication of, of, of X. Yeah? On, on the right. And here, for y, again, the, the morphism is uh, any linear transformations, and it's going to work by matrix multiplication on the right of y. And so these permutations, it's going to work just by permuting the rows, but permuting both of them together. Right? So if you swap row 1 and 2 of x, you also swap, swap row 1 and 2 of y. Okay, so that's the, the data set functor. And the other functor, which is the, the output functor, says how f is going to transform. Um, and so again, the, the, but, but now the twist is, this time it comes from a, a, the, the category x opposite times y times i. Uh, because it's going to be contravariant in X, and that's why I believe what we're dealing with is actually a dinatural uh, transformation. Um, so it, it sends a uh, the, the the object P Q N now to mappings from R P to R Q, right? And it forgets about N. N is gone, right? Because what we've done is we've got these two data matrices, and we've used the formula that now I've unfortunately erased, um, which uh, produces this matrix W, which is a P by Q matrix, and, and N is no longer relevant to that, right? It, it, the size of N is gone. So uh, we've, we've sent this category to the, uh, the set of all uh, P by Q uh, matrix. Sorry, we sent this object to the set of all uh, P by Q matrices. And how does it affect the outputs? Um, what happens to the morphisms? Well, this morphism that sends uh, RP to RP, the one that transforms X by multiplying on the right, 
is going to transform W by multiplying on the left by its inverse. And that's why this is contravariant, because it's an inverse. Uh, this one, as before, uh, sends to an action on the right, and the permutation of the rows has no effect at all. So the claim is that linear regression is a binatural transformation between these two functors D and P. All right, so um, it's not that hard to show. So, so let's do it one step at a time. We've got to show it's, it's natural in X. Sorry, it, it's, it's, it's natural in Y and I. And it's dinatural or, or contravariantly natural. I don't know what exactly the right term it is. I'm sorry, I put these in the wrong order. It's natural in Y. It's contravariantly dinatural, if that's the right word, in, in X. And it's natural in I. All right, so... so so this is, the, this is the real heart of the category theory here. So D of X, Y, and I is, uh, is the, the set, if we think about it coming from P uh, by uh, the, the, the X is R to the P, Y is R to the Q, and I is the set of endpoints. Um, this is the set of all these pairs of matrices. Uh, and the learning algorithm, alpha, um, is the natural transformation, and it's given by the following formula. So in other words, for every pair of matrices, X and Y, that we've got there, alpha, which is our learning algorithm, gives us a mapping from X to Y, from R to the P to R to the Q. And alpha is just given by this formula we saw before. Right? So we've got these two matrices, X and Y, uh, n by p and n by q, and it throws out a p by q matrix, in other words, a mapping from uh, r to the p to r to the q. Um, and what we want is that if we transform x by multiplying on the right, then and then we apply the, the learning algorithm, we get the same answer as if we'd applied the learning algorithm first, and then, uh, sorry, we've transformed y by multiplying on the right. Uh, if we apply the learning algorithm first, and then multiply, uh, then apply the, 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 the functor uh, p uh, to, to this multiplication, which multiplies w, our weight matrix, uh, on the right, uh, to get the, the transformation we would have got here. Did that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Now, for x, it's more complicated, because this is where it's contravariant. So if we're multiplying, um, so, yeah, so, so uh, p is a contravariant functor of um, x, <coughs> whereas d is a covariant functor of x. So rather than having an ordinary natural transformation, We've got this funny dinatural transformation, which commutes this way uh, round uh, the square. So the point is that um, P multiplies by Xi inverse, and D will multiply by Xi. Um, so what we want is that if we transform our, our data matrix, and then we learn on the transformed data matrix, and then we transform back uh, by, by P, we'll get the same answer as if we uh, uh, just started and not done any of the, the transformations. And, and finally, for I, which is the, the transformation of the rows of these matrices, um, we can permute the rows. And the idea is that if we apply the learning algorithm, we get the same answer as if we had permuted the rows and then apply the learning algorithm. And these are equal rather than being any mapping, because remember, P, um, it just ignores I. There is a trivial action of I after, after applying this mapping. All right, so let's quickly see how it works. And it's really just uh, matrix algebra. So the transformations of X and Y are as follows. 
um, multiplication on the right by psi and eta, and multiplication on the left by a matrix uh, sigma, which is a, uh, a, a matrix of zeros and ones, uh, what, what you could call a stochastic matrix of zeros and ones, in the sense that the rows and the columns all sum to one, a permutation matrix, basically. So we multiply on the left by x and y, both by the same matrix sigma to permute the rows, and we multiply on the right by these different things, psi and eta. Um, all right, so what does that do to alpha? This is our formula for alpha. Um, and if we now look at what happens after we apply that uh, mapping, it's just basic algebra. Uh, you know, we get x transpose goes to this, x goes to this. Um, because uh, sigma is um, or orthogonal, uh, we can get rid of those. Uh, and now... Because, uh, and now because psi is invertible, remember that we had assumed psi was finvec iso, and it needs to be, the, these uh, psi's, these mappings of x need to be invertible, because this is invertible, we can take these out uh, of, this, um, of this inverse here, and then this cancels with that, and before you know it, uh, we've got this, and this is exactly what we started with, um, except psi inverse and eta have been applied on the end. Yeah? Okay. Oh, uh, well, this, this gets at my question from before. Um, so since we just have vector space structure, how do we define orthogonal? Yeah. Because it seems that we would need an inner product structure, which already gives us, from the dimensional analysis point of view, um, sort of a natural dimension scale, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so that orthogonality applies only to sigma. The only thing we've assumed orthogonal is, I believe, is sigma. You're looking at these transposes here. Oh, which is on the index side. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was silly. Yeah. The only thing we're assuming is orthogonal is sigma. Okay, sounds good, yeah. Right. So actually, and, and this is the point, actually, sigma didn't need to be a permutation matrix. It actually could have been any orthogonal mono, any... Uh, left invertible, I forget which the terminology is, but any <laughs> matrix for which this uh, holds. Yeah. Um, so is there a reason for the X, basically, you know, that diagram, you have the P going the other way? Since C is invertible, couldn't you have had P go the other way? And that yeah, we could, we could easily have had this one go left and that one go right. Yeah, but what we couldn't do is have them both go in the same direction. At least I don't think so. Why not? Uh, because one of them is contravariant and the other one is covariant. <coughs> At least I think so. Right, you're saying replace C by C inverse. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you could totally do that, right? And then... And then, and then this one would go that way, and this one would go that way. I, I guess I'm asking whether P, the mapping of P, could take C and apply C inverse or something okay. like that. Have P be covariant by using C inverse. Yeah, well, by using well, actually C or something. I don't remember P using it. Okay, the, I, I don't think D and P can have the same variance. And, and you know, as, as I say, I'm, I'm not... I, category theorists, so it's quite possible I've, I've made a mistake here, uh, but um, the point is, um, right, if, if we apply, let's call it psi 1, psi 2, we've got x goes to x psi 1, psi 2, right, so we've applied psi 1, then we've applied psi 2, right, and, and, and here we've got w goes to um, psi 1, psi 2, inverse w, wait a second, I think you're right, actually. And this is equal to psi 2, inverse, yeah, no, you're right. Okay, it's, it's entirely possible I've got this wrong. And, um, and if someone were to do it right, that would be great. <laughs> but actually, I think I'd have it. I may be, you know, I may be wrong, and I'm trying to do it here in real time. It does appear that you're right. That if you apply psi 1, then psi 2 here, 
and then you apply the same thing here. You've got psi 2 inverse, then psi 1 inverse w. So you are applying psi 1 before psi 2. Yeah, you, you may be right, and I, I may have got this wrong. It's entirely possible. And that's kind of why I'm here, really, is I'm hoping the experts will be able to do it correctly. Um, so let, let's see. Um, okay, anyway, I, I, believe, I believe I've got it right. I'm still, I would say, 65% sure, but that, that, can, that can change. Um, all right, okay, so, so anyway, anyway, what about, what about ridge regression? Okay, so now we've got something different because we've got this lambda i here, and in this case, um, uh, it's only going to work if, if psi is, is orthogonal, right? So, um, and, and the reason is we get, we get the same way, we get up to here, um, and now uh, we can, uh, if psi is invertible, which is all we assumed before, again we can take psi uh, out to the left and the right, but then we've got this in here, and if we want to get back to where we started, then this uh, needs to be the identity matrix. In other words, mm -hmm. psi needs to be not just invertible, but also uh, orthogonal. And, um, uh, and, and so the, the summary is that for linear regression, um, it works if the category of x is invertible transformations, category of y is any linear transformations, and i is invertible um, Euclidean, in other words, orth orthogonal transformations. For ridge regression, <coughs> x is um, invertible um, orthogonal matrices, uh, but, but not invertible, one-sided invertible. In other words, the point is you can, you can take a, a vector and you can make it, map it into a higher dimensional space that's not an invertible matrix, but this sort of transformation still works. We only need a one-sided inverse. Um, y, again, is any linear transformations. And i, again, is any um, uh, one-sided invertible linear transformations, which means that rather than just permuting the rows, we're actually adding them together. Uh, as long as it's in an a, uh, orthogonal combination, that's not going to affect the output at all. And, and mapping the x and y columns is going to transform the, out, the output in a predictable way. Okay, so these are just some of the learning algorithms, and they were the ones that at least until today I thought I'd worked out. Um, and, um, but there are many others. So uh, at the beginning, we heard about principal component analysis. And I, I don't have proofs for these, but these are intuitions. Um, principal component analysis should be invariant under, again, uh, orthogonal transformations. And the reason is that it depends on the, um, the, the size of the variance. You've got to say which one which has a higher variance than another. There's another algorithm that's commonly used called independent component analysis, which is invariant to all invertible linear transformations. Um, there's two other families of algorithm, another family of algorithms, that rather than predicting x from y, it says, let me find the, the projections of x and y that are maximally correlated with each other. That's called canonical correlation analysis. There's three of them. Canonical correlation analysis, ridge regression. Uh, sorry, that shouldn't be ridge regression. That should be called um, reduced rank regression. That was a typo. Canonical correlation analysis, <coughs> reduced rank regression, and partial least squares. And these have different combinations of uh, invariances. Um, you can, instead of having this L2 norm for your regularization, you can have an L1 norm for the regularization. And in this case, you no longer have the uh, Euclidean invariance of the rows. You only have a permutation invariance which we started with. At least that's what I believe. I, I'm not certain about that. Is that equivalent to like lasso? Okay. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, support vector machines and other kernel-based methods that start from uh, these and now learn nonlinear functions will have much more complicated 
types of invariants determined by their kernel functions. And for neural networks, currently the leading uh, learning algorithms, I really don't have any idea what, uh, what, but that's the sort of thing that could be interesting uh, to look at. And, and so I just want to end with this conjecture. Um, so, the, and the conjecture comes from looking at this list and knowing what they're like. And the conjecture is that any learning algorithm that's invariant under all tra linear transformations, not just Euclidean transformations, is going to perform badly in high dimensions. So remember, the whole reason for introducing ridge regression was that when you have high dimensional data with many columns, it performs badly uh, when you come to generalize to new data. And the same is true for all of those algorithms that we just saw. They perform the ones, so, so in particular, um, uh, independent component analysis does badly in high dimensions. Principal component analysis does well in high dimensions. Canonical correlation analysis does badly in high dimensions. Ridge regression does badly if the predictor variable, sorry, reduced rank regression does badly, as it should have been, does badly if the predictor variable is in high dimension, but not the target variable, etc., etc. It seems like, it seems to fit that whenever something is invariant to all of these invertible linear transformations, it does badly in high dimensions. I don't even know how exactly to phrase the question. Uh, and in a sense, it's trivial, because remember, uh, for, at least for linear regression, the answer isn't even defined if p is greater than n. But it's also a fact that the performance declines when p gets close to n. Um, and, and so in order to ask the question, to formalize the question, we need some way to define the limit of a large number of observations. To let, in other words, to let p tend uh, to infinity. Right? And I don't know how to do that within the framework of category theory. I've been reading about category theory limits, but I'm not sure if that's actually going to do it. What might do it, and this is, comes from another <coughs> paper where we did a similar thing now in, in neuroscience, not using any category theory, uh, but a, a possible strategy would be to consider each dimension of X, in other words, each column, to be drawn from a probability distribution. So you've got a probability distribution of possible columns you could add to this, and then you can just draw continue, a continuous uh, probability distribution. You can just continue drawing more and more and more columns from this continuous probability distribution, and you can let that number tend to infinity. And, and, and what we showed for neural activity <coughs> is in recordings from the brain, the neurons which you're recording actually look like the columns of one of these matrices in the sense that you, you show, as, as we did in this case, a set of n images into the eye, and you record the activity of tens of thousands of neurons, they look like samples from a probability distribution. Um, so by letting the number of these dimensions tend to infinity, what you're doing is, is you're making every one of these rows uh, become convert tend to a vector in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, and, and you're projecting that into an ever larger number of finite dimensions. So that's a possible uh, proof strategy for, for, for this conjecture um, about why it might be that the performance of any learning algorithm does badly um, in high dimensions. Mm. And that's it. So thank you. Two minutes for some very quick questions. Okay. So since neural networks are trained with gradient descent, uh, once you need Euclidean structure to even talk about them? Euclidean structure on the weights, and therefore on the first layer of weights, and therefore on the data? Quite possibly. Yeah, quite possibly. Certainly, the, the output uh, is, is normally done by L2 error. So, so in that case, you definitely would. I might just add uh, this idea with the other learning methods. Uh, uh, there it is. Yeah. 
So support vector machines at Lambda, there has kind of a correlating um, hyperparameter. Yes. That, so that's, you it, can go back and forth. There, yeah. is, there is a way to convert back to Lambda. Uh, absolutely. So, so, um, uh, so, uh, re support vector machines are very much like this. The, uh, or actually, not literally support vector machines, but kernel. There's an algorithm called kernel ridge regression. Right. There literally is ridge regression, uh, but with the trick that you've replaced. Um, uh, well, okay, you use the matrix inversion lemma to 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 change this to instead of involving x transpose x to something that involves x x transpose. Right. So rather than yeah, yeah. the the similarity of the uh, of the of the columns to each other, it involves right. the similarity of the rows. That's sort of like other. the transformation to a dual version. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And now, and now, so you can rewrite this exactly the same thing using the matrix inversion lemma to depend only on on the similarity of the rows to each other. Mm -hmm. And then the point about the kernel methods is that um, then you're you can with kernelized you can, and they're just beyond inner products to be in. Yeah, you only need a pair of numbers for each of them. And it doesn't even need to come from a finite dimensional space. Um, and, and so, yes, absolutely, support vector machines and kernel methods are very, very related to this. And that's why I believe that it should be fairly tractable to find out what the invariances of those are, because it'll just be the invariances of this, of this kernel function when defined appropriately. OK, let's think about uh, uh, Okay. <laughs> Please join us for tea and coffee in the common room.